Um, they are not native here, and you'll see that the female has a collar on, them so we can track them. Uh, there are now about 200 of these goats up around the Black Hills. We have about eight of them that live here. Um, they were a gift from Canada to Custer State Park. The first night, half of them got out. The second night, the other half got out. And they're now wandering wherever they want to go. And as I said, we have about eight of them that live here in the park. Uh, earlier this summer, there were two babies. Their only known predator is the mountain lion, and we have a number of those around here. They are very elusive. It's not likely you will see one, but they are here. So just know that. And, and the mountain goats are, are kind of fun to watch because you may see them here, and they'll be right alongside the trail, but you can also see them up on the mountain sometime on, in an unbelievable cliff and they're up there and we've got photos of them up on top of Washington's head and under Roosevelt's chin and all kinds of places so why do we carve them out because it was there that makes sense I mean anybody else have a guess so people would come tourists so people would come and that's exactly why they carved them out in 1923, Doan Robinson was the state historian for South Dakota. He was looking for a way to attract tourists to western South Dakota. South Dakota is divided by the Missouri River right down the middle. Eastern South Dakota, much more farming, more industry, more people, does pretty well. Western South Dakota is more ranching, less people, not much industry, and so they were looking for a way to improve that. They thought tourism would be a pretty good way, and judging from our numbers, I'd say they were right. We get about 3 million visitors, mostly during the summer here every year. And that ranks within the top 10 of national parks around the country. Now, Doan Robinson heard about a fellow that was down in Georgia at Stone Mountain, carving that mountain down there, and he thought that that would be a pretty good idea. So he invited Guts and Borglum out here, to take a look at some of the, the Black Hills and see if they couldn't find something that they could use for a, a candidate to do a carving. Well, they started looking over here in the Needles, about 10 miles away. And Borglum looked at that and thought that they were too far gone, too deteriorated to really do a carving. So they spent a couple of weeks, looked around, and found Mount Rushmore. Now, there are several reasons why he chose Mount Rushmore. One was that it is Harney Peak granite. It's very hard, doesn't deteriorate much at all, and it faces southeast, so it has excellent morning sun. The mountain was carved to be viewed between 8 and 10 in the morning. That's when the least amount of shadows are on the faces. But Borglum still had work to do back in Georgia. So he goes back there, continues to work, and gets into an argument with the people running the project. They fire him. He takes his models and pushes them off the top of the mountain. Needless to say, that did not make them very happy back there, and they literally chased him out of Georgia with a sheriff on his tail. <laughs> now, if you have been to Stone Mountain recently, the work that is on that mountain is not Borglum's. They hired somebody else to try to finish it. He messed it up. They blew it off the mountain, and what is there today was done in the 60s or 70s. About Doan Robinson is that he wanted to do Western heroes. He wanted to do Lewis and Clark and Sitting Bull and folks like that. Borglum, when he got out here, Borglum, you, everything you hear about him, you have to add in his ego to go with that. He thought he could do everything, and that was part of what got him in trouble down at Stone Mountain. He thought he could do the business side better than the people that were doing the business side. He thought that if he was going to do this project, and it was going to be a big enough project, that he wanted to make sure he got enough attention. So he wanted presidents because that would draw a national audience, and he was right. We get people from all over the world looking at this mountain. So he suggested presidents. And since it was 1927, he suggested something in honor of the 150th anniversary of the founding of the United States. So the four presidents that are up there are up there for that reason. 
Now today, we would do all kinds of things very, very differently than they did in 1927. I mean, we would be voting by Twitter to see who, which president should be up there. We would be, you know, we'd, we'd have a huge committee, and, and AT&T would own the mountain or something. <laughs> Take about the size of, of the sculptures first, so that you, as we walk along the trail here, you can visualize that and think about sizes. The heads are about 60 feet tall. The noses are about 20 feet. The mouths are about 11 feet wide. There are several pieces on there that are special, and those eyes that I talked about at the beginning are one of them. Borglum left a piece of granite about 18 inches by 9 inches in each eye socket. Then he viewed it from his studio down off the hillside in the morning and looked at how the light reflected off of those pieces of granite. Then he went back to the mountain and carved them so that they reflected that morning light. So that's why the eyes, they're all different shapes, but it has to do with that morning light. So watch that. Now if Washington was carved all the way to the ground, he would be 465 feet tall. So he's shorter than the Washington Monument, in the neighborhood, I think it's it's uh, several hundred feet shorter than the St. Louis Arch, but there's a display in the visitor center that will show you that. Now, Washington is up there for a number of reasons. He was father of our country. He was our first president, commanding general of the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War, and he was very much loved by the people. But he left us a couple of things related to our democracy that are really pretty special. When he was made president, he was offered president for life, and he turned that down. He said, no, we had an eight-year war to throw off the king, and you're not going to make me king. So he served two terms. They offered him a third. He said, no, he didn't think he had lived that long. And in those days, they didn't have this whole succession thing all laid out the way we do on the 25th Amendment today. So he served two terms, and until Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1940s, no one exceeded that. We now have a constitutional amendment that makes two terms maximum, but that all started with George Washington.